And we're here. Hello, good evening. Look, I even have the microphone on this time. Ha ha. No flies on this boy. Anyway, hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you may happen to be. Um, I'm Tad. I will be here for another hour and uh, we'll be reading from El Trono de Huesos de Dragón. Dragón, Dragón. Um, can't remember the names in all the other countries. Um, anyway, that was the Spanish, in case you didn't know. El Trono de Huesos del Dragón. Del Dragón. Anyway. See, I already said anyway three times, and I've barely started. It's 101, and I've already said it several times. Um, hi, hope you're having a good week so far. Um, things have been good for you through the weekend to this point. It is now 1.01 in the morning California time. I am ready to read. Um, we thank heaven, thank everything. Um, finally have water back on here after like four or five days of no water. Well, only the water we brought in, whether rainwater collected in pots or jugs bought at the store. But we have actual water now. We have water. We have electricity. We've got all the comforts of home in our home, which uh, may not sound like much to you guys, but for me, it's a big deal. Um, so everything good in that regard. It's been a very wet, rainy, blustery day. As a matter of fact, I was watching something on television and as I do after uh, Deborah goes to sleep, um, I have a pair of headphones, you know, the like infrared ones, so you can watch TV without bothering anybody else. So, of course, I was sitting there watching something on television with the sound cranked up semi loud. And all of a sudden, this like thing, this just shadowy thing, just leaps up out of the darkness of the floor area of the bedroom and crashes onto me, and I realize that there is an entire dog butt, a rather large dog butt, about yay big, just clenched on my face. Um, this was a shocking and disturbing realization, I have to say. Um, and as I'm struggling with this large dog fundament, um, trying to move it off my face, I understand that it's Johnny because Walter's butt is only about that wide. Um, and, but I have no idea why there is a huge dog sitting on my head. Um, and at that moment, um, one of our young people comes in and says, and of course I've got my headphones on underneath the large lump of dog rear end. And I pull my headphones off and say, what? There's a dog sitting on my head. And our young person says, did you hear that? I said, no, but I figured something loud had happened. And it turned out, I guess it was just a, a loud spatter of hail in the middle of a, you know, what had been kind of a mild rain for the last 20 minutes before that. But as I said, I knew that something had to have happened because this large, this large dog of ours, this 35, 40 kilo dog had just leaped up and sat on my head, which is what he does when he's nervous. He either whacks me with his paw if he's only semi-nervous, um, which again, is, can be startling when you're asleep. But, um, or if he's really af afraid, he leaps up on the bed and gets as far toward the back of the bed as he can, which is usually where my head is. And that's what he had done, of course. Anyway, I have since then calmed him down, and he is okay. Um, but uh, it was it was a bit of a shock, and it's very hard to breathe through the rear end of a large dog. Just in case any of you are thinking of taking it up as a hobby, no, do not recommend. Anyway, what else? So um, have finished, have finished the uh, first draft as mentioned, and I am doing the rewrite and sending it out in chunks to the, to the people who, uh, to help me to, to bring this, this oversized porker to market. Um, and uh, so I've sent out the first 10 chapters and I'm about 
on chapter 14 or 15. So another few days and I'll be sending out the next 10 chapters. Um, uh, the, the, the process is kind of mind bending because of course, this was the book that was most affected by COVID and various other things going on. So as a result, it has been written in several different chunks at several different times. And there are, you know, I, I, there are many different parts where I literally wrote them. And as I was writing them, I was saying, this is not going to stand. I'm going to have to rewrite this bit. So it's also the manuscript is covered with notes. It's covered with consider dropping this or have so-and-so do such and such instead or, you know, all these things. So um, in most cases, I remember what those referred to. In other cases, I have no inkling whatsoever, even though it's my note. So I'm looking at it saying, I know it means something. Um, I'm assuming that since I bothered to put a note in red here at the beginning of the chapter that says whatever the gibberish is that I'm now left with, that it meant something at the time that I should have known, uh, that I should know now what it means, but not always the case. Anyway, so I am slowly working my way through the manuscript. And um, despite all of the, <laughs> the issues of too long, too much plot, too many characters, too much of everything. I, I'm generally pleased with it as a book. I think it's going to be a good final volume once I beat it into shape. Um, I think that there's enough exciting and surprising things that happen in it that the readers will enjoy it. At least that is my fervent prayer. Look, see, I'm actually, I'm accidentally and subconsciously making praying gestures here. That is my prayer. Um, but we'll find out when, when we find out. That's all I can do is just keep slogging forward uh, through rain, through snow, through sleet, through hail, through dog butts in the dark of night. That's all I can do. Anyway, so I am, before reading, I'm going to check in and see who is here and who has checked in with me. And uh, then I am going to begin reading. So, because I don't really have a lot else to say this week. There's not, you know, that's been what I've been doing work-wise. I'm trying to now, now that the worst of the, the current, most recent <laughs> crisis is over and we have water and stuff, I'm trying to, you know, contact people I haven't talked to in the last few months to say, you know, we're not dead, by the way. Um, you know, we've just had a difficult time with one thing and another, and we're still here. We still love you. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that's basically where I'm at. So let me check and see where you guys are at, at least those of you who have popped in to say hello. And first up is Chris. Hello. Good morning. Good to see you. Olaf, my friend. Good to see you, too. Good morning. Suzanne, checking in from Yorkshire. Tisha the cat is on my arms. Yeah, that's... That's actually the only thing I escape with Lily because Lily doesn't, Lily's not actually a lap cat. I don't, you know, as I mentioned, she's kind of weirdly unsocialized. And so she likes to be petted, but she doesn't want to really be picked up or anything like that. And she won't jump up in your lap no matter how easy you make it. But if you lie down, she will come and lie down next to you. I guess that feels safer to her somehow. I don't know. Um, the day that I can figure out cats, um, I will be a much smarter person than I am today. Anyway, so hello, Suzanne, and I'm glad you and Tisha are hanging out. Jeremy, hello. I look relaxed. I look, what's the word I'm looking for? I look hydrolyzed. No, that's not the word. I look, what, what, I've just gone blank on it, whatever the word is for when you finally, hydrated. I look hydrated. <laughs> the house is hydrated. We have water. The plumbing works. It's a glorious miracle of the 21st century. So that's probably what you're noticing. I don't think I'm any cleaner or whatever, but I'm definitely, you know, that's like one less thing. I'm not going to be standing out in the pouring rain listening to, you know, various people from various companies explain to me why they don't know what's going on with our well system. Well, I probably will be again, but I'm not at the moment. <laughs> it's temporarily solved, so... That's a good thing. Mark, good morning, good morning. Good to see you. Another Yorkshire person checks in. Tom, hello, hello from frosty Ireland. Ooh, does sound cold. Um, it's not that here. California, we're actually having a very wet winter by our standards, which is probably a climate change thing. Um, but it's also hard to tell because like once every five, six, seven years, we have a wet winter. 
and then we have years and years of drought again so um holger hello holger is here read that our cat was not doing so well what was the matter um we don't kabu named after the character is not a cat that we have um, and we only have one cat now who's lily so i'm not sure what that refers to you, you will have to go back to your source material and let me know and i can help you figure that out as far as i know yep there's lily over there she's fine you can tell she's healthy at least in terms of being large um large and in charge so that's the only cat we have at the moment we're down to three pets because the snake moved out along with two of our young people and um, we lost our, our dear Chihuahua last year, Frankie, um, who, who was the star of Deborah's um, Twitter feed for many years um, that she wrote in his voice. Uh, he had his own Twitter page, actually. Um, and, uh, but we're, we're down to one cat and two dogs at this point, which does feel strange to me. It feels very strange to only have three animals to have to worry about. So anyway... See if you can figure out where that came from, Holger, and I can give you some information if what that might be referring to. Christy, good morning, good morning. Good to see you, and good to have you here. Penny, hello, nice to see you. Iris, good morning, good day, good evening to you also, as always a pleasure. Cliff, hello. Yes, me and mine have had a good week, and I'm glad to hear that you are all well at your place. Um, yeah, I was over with my dad last night, and he was doing pretty good. We watched... Uh, uh, Stephen Colbert together because they had Eddie Izzard on and Eddie Izzard has like been a long time favorite of mine um, and Debs and we took our family out to see them and uh, to see her now because Eddie has is now his pro her pronouns are now she uh, she her her she however that goes uh, but anyway, but Eddie is one of the funniest people in the whole world. And uh, so even though it wound up being just an interview and wasn't any actual comedy bit, it was very good to see her. So um, so that's what I've been doing. I've been hanging out with the family now that we got the water fixed. But I am now home, as you can tell from my gorilla with a, whoops, gorilla with a bowler hat and plump sedentary cat behind me. So... Uh, bup, 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 bup. Debbie, hello, good morning. Checking in from very chilly England where we are never prepared for winter. I know, you remember I lived, you may not remember, but I lived in England. Um, I think I was even living in England sometime around the time when all the trains shut down because it had snowed and they said to the, uh, the person in charge of Brit Rail at the time or the spokesperson, they said, wow, you know, why you guys are supposedly had spent these millions of pounds preparing for snow and the Brit Rail spokesperson said, well, it was the wrong kind of snow, which was became kind of famous at the time. So I know how things are in England and now they're never quite prepared for winter. Kristen, hello. Um, yes, our power has stayed on. Fingers crossed, knock wood. I, I hope that it continues to. You never can tell. Again, we live... Yeah, not that far out of town, but we're kind of in the hills. We're surrounded by trees. We like it that way. We planned it that way. That's why we picked this house in the first place. Um, because when you work from home, both of you, you know, both husband and wife or spouse and spouse work from home, it's important what your surroundings are. So we love the trees. We love the fact that we're kind of in the woods and in the hills. Um, what we don't love is that every winter, several times, and occasionally in the spring as well, that that um, and other times of the year, just randomly, trees just fall over and take out the power lines, which is never much fun. But I'm not complaining because, as I said, we made this choice. So, you know, even the water and stuff going out, it's part of what you get for living in the country. But anyway, so yes, our power stayed on so far. Otherwise, you wouldn't be seeing me. Um, and it still might go out. These things don't always happen during the storm. Sometimes the trees just stand there for a while after the storm going like this, and then they suddenly go, <laughs> and there goes all the power for the neighborhood. Uh, Vouter, good evening. Good, good evening, good evening. Still from a warm bed after a crappy asthmatic night. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. I'm sorry to hear it, but I'm glad you're taking it easy. Nicole, 
Good morning to you. Good to see you. Ron. Hello, Mr. Ron. Hello, hello. A pleasure as always to have you with me. Anamika. Anamika. Good morning. Good morning. Christina. Good morning and hello. Petra checked in earlier to say she couldn't be with us today. That's Christina's sister. Um, but I am very pleased, Christina, that you're here. And Christina also is under a warm blanket, which is a good, good idea. Um, Kristen says her parents live in a flat part of Los Gatos, which is just over the hill from us, and their power was out all day. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Hazel, good morning, sweetie. That's my mother-in-law. Good morning, good morning. Not very nice over there. Frost and cold. Well, now that we've got our water back on, things are good here. So thank you for asking. I'm sorry to hear about your frost and cold. Um, I suggest you put a couple of neighbors on the fire. That, that always helps. Um, but anyway, good to see you. Lots of love. Your daughter is sleeping the sleep of the just uh, and the hardworking upstairs right now. Let me see. Who else have I not said hello to yet? There's everybody checking in. Andre Stark. Hello, hello. Uh, Mr. Williams, I I'm never entirely comfortable being Mr. Williams. Um, perhaps I, it, it's an affectation now at this point, I suppose, but um, if you please feel free to call me Tad. Everybody else does, um, except for the people who call me Poncho. That's a different group of people. Um, who else have I not said hello to? Isaac. Hi, hi, howdy. Um, Andre says, I have just come to the bridge in Anvijanya. Why do you have the feeling be more than one book to finish The Last King of Ostinar? Bite your tongue. Uh, as I said, I'm done with the first draft. It is extremely long, but I, I think I'm going to be able to get it out in that one single volume. So please don't scare me or my publishers. Um, we should be able to finish with just Navigator's Children. Um, Christina says, oh, Petra's your mom. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you guys were sisters. Oh, well, that's okay. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I am was really close with my, with my parents, still am with my dad. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So Petra's your mom. Ah, okay. Well, now I know. And I still like you both just as much as I did before. Neither one of you is in trouble, either for being a child or for having had a child. Because having a child is the kind of mistake that any of us can make and then repent at leisure, as I have for years. Uh, Becky, hello. Good to see you. That's Becky Willems checking in at the end. And so, all right. Now that I've got all that straightened out and I found this important thing about Petra and Christina, which I didn't realize, and I'll have to make up a little mnemonic in my mind so I can remember which one of you is the mom. So I'll think P, Petra, parent. C, Christina, C, H, Christina, child. Not that you're a child, but these are called mnemonics, folks. I'm, this, is, this is the educational portion of tonight's broadcast. Mnemonic. One of those tricky Greek words with an M and an N at the beginning, like those other tricky Greek words with a P and an S at the beginning or things like that. Those Greeks are tricky. Anyway... Where we last were, Simon had been hanging around with Towser and Duke is Grimner and Sang Fugel when, and they'd been talking about the fact that now a mystery seems to have evolved around the three swords mentioned in Nissi's um, poem, his, his, his Weird of the Swords. And, um, but they were saying that they didn't ha know anything about bright, about Miniar, which is the last of the swords and thorn. They don't know the location of, and, um, the only one they know of for certain is sorrow, which of course Elias was given by the Norns. And so it's currently with Elias anyway. And Towser got very excited and said, take me to Joshua. I know about the one of the swords. So that's where we are. We understand your place in these events, good Towser, Joshua said impatiently. The prince, perhaps to ward off the all-pervasive chill, had wrapped a woolen scarf tightly around his throat. <coughs> Excuse me. The prince, perhaps to ward off the all-pervasive chill, had wrapped a woolen scarf tightly around his throat. 
The tip of his slender nose was pink. I, I'm just setting the place, so to speak, your highness, Towser said complacently. If I might have a cup of wine to help ease the talk, I will get to the main course directly. Miss Grimner, Joswa groaned, would you be good enough to find our venerable jester something to drink? For I fear we shall be here until Aidentide, waiting for the rest of the story. The Duke of Elvritschala went to the cedar cabinet beside Joswa's table and found a ewer of red Perdruan wine. Here, he said, handing a filled flagon to Towser, who sipped and smiled. It's not the wine he's wanting, the Rimmersman thought. It's the attention. These are grim enough days for the young and useful, let alone for an old trickster whose master is two years dead. He stared at the jester's seamed face and for a moment thought he saw the child's countenance trapped beneath as behind a thin curtain. God grant me a quick, honorable death, his Grimner prayed, and never let me be one of those old fools who sit by the campfire telling the young men that things will never be as good as they once were. Still, he thought as he moved back to his chair, listening to the lupine howling of the winds outside, Still it may be true this time. Maybe we have seen the better days. Maybe there's nothing left now but a losing battle against creeping darkness. You see, Towser was saying, Camaris's sword, Thorn, didn't go with him into the ocean. He had given it over for safekeeping to his squire, Cullman of Rodstonby. Gave away his sword, Joshua said, puzzled. That accords with none of the stories I have ever heard of Camara Savinita. Ah, but you did not know him in his last year. And how could you, since you'd only just come into the world? Towser took another swig and stared meditatively up at the ceiling. Sir Camaris grew strange and fell after your mother, Queen Abeka, died. He was her special protector, you know, and he worshipped the very tiles she trod upon, as if she were Elysia, the mother of God herself. I, I always thought he blamed himself for her death, as though he could somehow have cured her ill health by force of arms or by the purity of his heart. Poor Egypt. Seeing Joswa's impatience, his Grimner leaned forward. So he gave the star sword dawn to his squire? Yes, yes, said the old man testily, not liking to be rushed. When Camaris was lost in the sea off Harcha Island, Coleman took it for his own. He went back and reclaimed his family's lands at Rudstonby in their frost march and became the baron of a good sized province. Dorn was a famous weapon through all the world, but and, and when his enemies saw it, for it was unmistakable, all shiny black, but for the silver hilt, a beautiful, perilous thing, they would none of them face him. He seldom even had to draw it from its scabbard. So it is then at Rodstenby, Binnebeck said excitedly from the corner. That is near within two days' ride from where we are now sitting. No, 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 growled Towser, waving his flagon for his Grimner to fill again. If you would only wait, troll, I will tell you all. Before Binnebeck or the priest or anyone else could respond, Yarnauga stood up from his crouch by the fire and leaned toward the little jester. Towser, he said, and his voice was as hard and cold as ice in the roof thatches. We cannot wait on your pace. There is a grave darkness spreading from the north, a cold and fatal shadow. We must have the sword, do you understand? He brought his sharp face even closer to Towser's, and the little man's tufted eyebrows shot upward in alarm. We must find Thorn, for soon the Storm King himself will be knocking at our door. Do you understand? 
Towser gaped as Yarnauga dropped back into his long-limbed squat beside the hearth. Well, as Grimner mused, if we wanted the latest news shouted all over Naglum, and now we'll have it done. Still, it does look as though he's put a bit of a burr under Towser's saddle. It took a few moments for the jester to be able to tear his startled, fascinated eyes from the glare-eyed northerner. When he turned, he no longer looked to be enjoying his status quite as much. Colman, he began, Sir Colman heard travelers' tales of the dragon Igjarjuk's legendary horde in the heights of the mountain Ermsheim. It was a treasure said to be richer than any other in the wide world. Only a flatlander would be thinking of searching out a mountain dragon. And for gold, Benebic said disgustedly, my people have long lived near Ermsheim, and we are living long because we are not going there. But you see, old Towser said, the dragon has been only a story for generations. No one has seen it, no one has heard of it, except for snow maddened wanderers. And Coleman had the sword Thorn, a magic sword to lead him on a quest for a ma magic dragon's hoard. But what idiocy, Joshua said. Did he not have everything he wanted? A powerful barony, the sword of a hero? Why would he go rapping off after such a madman's vision? Damn me, Joshua, his Grimner swore. Why do men do any of the things they do? Why did they... Hang our Lord Osiris topsides down from the tree. Why should Elias imprison his brother and make bargains with demons when he is already high king of all Ostenard? There are indeed things in men and women that make them reach for what is beyond their grasp, Jan Alga said from his hearth corner. Sometimes the things they seek lie beyond the bounds of understanding. Benebic jumped lightly to the floor. Too much talk is this of things we can never know, he said. Our question still is, where is the sword? Where is Thorn? Lost in the north, I'm sure, Towser said. I've never heard that Sir Coleman came back from his quest. One traveler's tale was that he had made himself a king of the Hunan, and lives there still, in a fortress of ice. It sounds as though his story has been muddled and mixed with old memories of Ineluki, Yarnauga said thoughtfully. He made it as far as the monastery of St. Skendi at Vestvenby, Father Strangyard piped up unexpectedly from the back of the room. He had gone out quickly and come back without anyone's noticing. He wore a faint flush of pleasure high on his thin cheeks. Tatauser's words sparked a memory. I thought I had some of the monastic books of Skendi's order salvaged from its burning during the Frost March Wars. Here is the household ledger for the founding year 1131. See, it lists the outfitting of Coleman's party. He passed it proudly to Joshua, who held it up to the firelight. Dried meat and fruits, Joshua read, straining to make out the faded words. Wool cloaks, wool cloaks, too. Horses, he looked up. It says here a party of a dozen and one. Thirteen. He passed the book on to Binnebeck, who took it back to pour over with Yarnauga by the fire. Then they must have run into bad luck. Towser said, refilling his flagon. The stories I heard said he set out from Rodstonby with over two dozen of his hand-picked best. Its Grimner was staring after the troll. He's certainly clever enough, the Rimmersman thought, although I don't, tr I don't trust him or his kind much. And what's his hold on that boy? I'm not sure I like that either although I think the stories they both tell are largely true. What good is all this to us now, he said aloud. 
If the sword is lost, it is lost, and we must simply make the best of our defenses here. Duke is Grimner, Benebeck said. You are not understanding, perhaps. There is no choice for us. If indeed the Storm King is our greater enemy, as I think we are all agreeing now, then the only thing for hope, <coughs> it seems, is I, that we acquire the three swords. Two are for now denied from us. That leaves Thorn, and we must find it, if finding is possible. Don't instruct me, little man. His Grimner growled, but Joshua waved his hand wearily to forestall their argument. Quiet now, the prince said. Please let me think. My brain is fevered with so many madnesses heaped one atop the other. I need some moments of quiet. Strangyard, Yarnauga, and Binnebeck poured over the monastery ledger and Morganis's manuscript, talking in whispers. Towser finished his wine, his Grimner sipping moodily beside him. Joshua sat staring into the fire. The prince's weary features looked like parchment pulled over bone. The Duke of Elvritsala could hardly bear to look at him. His father looked no worse in his last dying days, his Grimner brooded. Has he the strength to lead us through a siege, as it looks to come to soon? Has he even the strength himself to survive? He has ever been a thinker, a warrior. Although, in fairness, he is no slouch with sword and shield. Without thinking, he got up and stumped over to the prince's side, laying an ursine paw on Joshua's shoulder. The prince looked up. Can you spare me a good man, old friend? Do you have one who knows the northeast country? His Grimner looked thoughtful. I have two or three. Frecke, though, is too old for a journey, such as I imagine you are thinking of. Ein Skaldir would not leave my side unless I pushed him out the gate of Nagelmund at spear point. Besides, I have a mind that we will need his fierceness here when the fighting grows hot and bloody. He is a badger, fierce-blooded and best when he is backed into a hole. The duke mused. Of the rest, I would give you Sludig. He is young and fit, but he is also clever. Yes, Sludig will be the man for you. Good. Joshua nodded his head slowly. I have some three or four I will send, but a small party is better than a large. For what? Exactly. His Grimner looked around the room at its sparse solidity and wondered again whether they were chasing phantoms, whether the wintry weather had somehow chilled their better judgment. To search for Camaris's sword, Uncle Bearskin, the prince said with a ghost of a smile. It is doubtless madness, and we have nothing better to go on than old stories and a few faded words in old books but it is not a chance we can afford to ignore. It is storm-fraught winter in the summer month of Juven. None of our doubts can change that. He looked around the room, mouth pursed in thought. Binibik, a Vikranuk, he called at last, and the troll hurried over. Will you lead a party on the Trail of Thorn? You know the northern mountains better than anyone here, except perhaps Yarnauga, who I hope will go, too. I would be full of honor, Prince, Binnebeck said, and dropped to one knee. Even his Grimner was forced to grin. I am honored to Prince Joshua, Yarnauga said, rising. But I think it is not to be. Here at Naglemund I will best serve. My legs are old, but my eyes are still keen. I will help Strangyard in the archives, for there are many questions still to answer, many riddles behind the story of the Storm King, 
and the whereabouts of Fingil's sword Minia. And there may yet be other ways I can serve as well. Your Highness, Benebeck asked, if there is a place unfilled, may I have your permission to take young Simon? Morgenes was asking as his last wish that the boy be watched over by my master. With Ukekuk's death, I am master now and would not be shirking this watching over. Joshua looked skeptical. And you would look after him by taking him on a mad expedition into the unmapped north? Binnebeck raised an eyebrow. Unmapped by big people, perhaps. It is the commons yard of my Canuck folk. Also, is it more safe to leave him shut up in a castle set for warring with the High King? The prince brought his long hand up to his face, as though his head pained him. You are right, I suppose. If these slender threads of hope come to naught, there will be no safe places for those who have sided with the Lord of Naglamond. If the boy wishes to go, you may take him. He brought his hand down and clasped Benebeck's shoulder. Very well, little man. Little, but brave. Go back to your books, and I shall send you three good Urkenlanders and is Grimner's man Sludig in the morning. My thanks, Prince Joshua, Benebeck nodded. But I think it is at night tomorrow we should be leaving. We will be a small party, and our best hope is in not attracting evil attention. So be it, said Joshua, rising and lifting his hand as though in benediction. Who knows if this is some fool's errand or the rescue of us all. You should be going out amid trumpets and applause. Instead, necessity must override honor, and stealth must be the watchword. Know that our thoughts are with you. Is Grimner hesitated, then leaned forward and clasped Binnebeck's small hand. Damned strange this is, he said, but God be with you. If Sludig should get contentious, be forgiving. He is high-spirited, but his heart is good, and his loyalty strong. Thank you, Duke, the troll said seriously. May your God be blessing us indeed. We go into unknown places. As do all mortals, Joshua added, sooner or later. What? You told the prince and everyone I would go where? Simon balled his fists in anger. What right did you have to do that? Simon, friend, Benedict calmly responded. You are under no order to go. I was only asking Joshua's permission for your being on this search, and it was granted. The choosing is for you. This bloody tree! What else can I do now? If I say no, everyone will think I'm a coward. Simon, the little man put on a look of patience. First, please do not be using your new learned soldier curses on me. We Kanuk are a courteous folk. For a second, it is not good worrying so on others' opinions. Anyway, staying at Naglaman will certain, certainly not be for cowards. Simon hissed a great frosty cloud of breath and hugged himself. He stared up at the murky sky, at the dull blur of sun secreted behind the clouds. Why are people always making decisions for me without asking first? Am I a child? He stood for some moments, red-faced from more than the chill, until Binnebeck reached out a small, gentle hand. My friend... I am sorrowful, 
This was not the honor I was hoping it to be. An honor of dreadful, dreadful danger, of course, but an honor. I have explained of what importance we think this quest, of how the fate of Naglamund and all the North may hang on its accomplishing, and, of course, that all may be perishing without fame or song in the white northern wastes. He patted Simon's knuckles solemnly, then reached into the pocket of his fur-lined jacket. Here, he said, and put something hard and cold into Simon's fingers. Momentarily distracted, he opened his hand to look. It was a ring, a plain, thin circlet of some golden metal. On it was inscribed a simple design, a long oval, with a tipped triangle at one end. The fish sign of the League of the Scroll, Benebic said. Morgenes tied this thing to the sparrow's leg, along with the note of which I was speaking before. The end of the note told, This was for you. Simon held it up, trying to catch a gleam of the dull sunlight. I never saw Morgenes wear it he said, a little surprised, that it startled up no memories. Do all the League members have one? Besides, how could I be worthy to wear it? I can hardly read. My spelling isn't very good either. Binnebic smiled. My master did not have such a ring, or at least I never was seeing it. As for the other... Morgenis was wanting you to have it, and that is permission enough, I have sureness. Binnebic, Simon said, squinting, it has writing on the inside. He held it up for the troll to inspect. I can't read it. The troll narrowed his eyes. It is writing in some Scythi tongue, he said, turning the ring to peruse its inner rim. Hard to read for being very small and in a style I do not know. He studied it a moment longer. Dragon. That character means, Benebic read at last, and this one means, I believe, death. Death and the dragon. Death of the dragon. He looked up at Simon, grinned, and shrugged. What it might be meaning, I have no idea. My knowledge is not deep enough. Some conceit of your doctors is my guessing. <coughs> or perhaps a family motto. Perhaps Yarnauga could read it with more ease. It slid easily onto the third finger of Simon's right hand as though it had been made for him. Morgenes had been so small. How could he have worn this? Do you think it's a magic ring? He asked suddenly, narrowing his eyes as though he might detect spells swarming around the golden circle like minuscule bees. If so, Benebic said mock somberly, Morgenes included no grammary for explaining its using. He shook his head. I think it not a likelihood, a keepsake, from a man who was caring for you. Why are you giving it to me now? Simon asked, feeling a certain sorrowful tightness behind his eyes that he was determined to resist. Because I must be leaving tomorrow night to go north. If you decide for remaining here, we might not have the opportunity to meet again. Pinnebeck! The tightening increased. He felt like a small child pushed back and forth between bullying elders. The truth it is, only. The troll's round face was entirely serious now. He raised his hand to forestall more protests and questions. Now you must be deciding, my good friend. I go into the snow and ice country, on an errand that may be foolishness, and which may claim the lives of the fools who are following it. Those who remain are facing the anger of a king's army, 
An evil choosing, I fear. Bitterbeck nodded his head gravely. But, Simon, whatever, whichever it is for you, going north or staying to fight for Naglamund and Princess, we will be the best of comrades still, yes? He stood on tiptoe to clap Simon on the upper arm, then turned and walked away across the courtyard toward the archives. Simon found her standing alone, tossing pebbles into the castle well. She wore a heavy traveling cloak and a hood against the cold. Hello, princess, he said. She looked up and smiled sadly. For some reason, she seemed much older today, like a grown woman. Welcome, Simon. Her breath made a halo of mist about her head. He began to bend his knee in a bow, in a bow, but she was no longer looking. Another stone rattled down the well. He considered sitting down, which seemed the natural thing to do, but the only place to sit was the edge of the well, which would either put him uncomfortably close to the princess or leave him facing in the wrong direction. He decided to remain on his feet. And how have you been? he said at last. She sighed. My uncle treats me as though I am made of eggshells and cobwebs, like I would shatter if I lifted anything or if anyone bumped into me. I'm sure that I'm sure that he's only worried for your safety after the dangerous journey you had to get here. The dangerous journey we had but nobody's following you around to make sure you don't skin your knee. They're even teaching you how to fight with a sword. Mary, a princess, Simon was more than a little shocked. You don't want to fight with swords, do you? She looked up at him and their eyes met. For an instant, her stare burned like the noonday sun with some inexplicable longing. A moment later, she wearily dropped her gaze again. No, she said, I suppose not. But, oh, I do wish to do something. Surprised, he heard the real pain in her voice, and in that moment remembered her as she had been on the flight up the stile, uncomplaining and strong, as good a companion as could be wished. What, what do you want to do? She looked up again, pleased by the serious tone of his question. Well, she began, it's no secret that Joshua is having trouble convincing Davis Sallies that his master, Duke Leobardus, should support the prince against my father. Joshua could send me to Naban. Send you to Naban? Of course, you idiot, she frowned. On my mother's side, I am of the Ingaterine house, a very noble family of Naban. My aunt is married to Leobardus. Who better to go and convince the duke? She clapped her gloved hands for emphasis. Oh, Simon was unsure of what to say. Perhaps Joshua thinks that it would be, would be, I don't know, he considered. I mean to say, should the High King's daughter be the one to arrange alliances against him? And who knows the High King's ways better? Now she was angry. Do you? He hesitated, but his curiosity won out. How do you feel towards your father? Do I hate him? Her tone was bitter. I hate what he has become. I hate what the men around him have put him up to. If he would suddenly find goodness in his heart and see the error of his ways, well, then I would love him again. A whole procession of stones went down the well as Simon stood uncomfortably by. I'm sorry, Simon, she said at last. I have become very bad at talking with people. My old nurse would be shocked at how much I have forgotten running around in the forest. 
How are you? And what have you been doing? Binibic has asked me to go with him on a mission for Joshua, he said, bringing the subject up more abruptly than he had meant to. To the north, he added significantly. Instead of showing the expressions of worry and fear he had expected, the princess's face seemed to light up from within. Although she smiled at him, she did not truly seem to see him. Oh, Simon, she said, how brave, how fine. Can you, when do you leave? Tomorrow night, he said, dimly aware that somehow by some mysterious process, asked to go had become going. But I, I haven't decided yet, he said feebly. I thought I might be more needed here at Naglaman to wield a spear on the walls. He tacked on the last, just in case there was any possibility. She thought he might be staying behind to work in the kitchens or something like. Oh, but Simon, Miriam L. said, reaching up suddenly to take his cold hand in her leather-gloved fingers. If my uncle needs you to do it, you must. We have so little hope left from all I've heard. She reached up to her neck and quickly unfastened the sky-blue scarf she wore, a slender, gauzy strip. She handed it to him. Take this and bear it for me, she said. Simon felt the blood come roaring up into his cheeks and struggled to keep his lips from stretching into a shocked, moon-calfish grin. Thank you, princess, he said at last. If you wear it, she said, standing up. It will be almost as though I were there myself. She did a funny little dance step and laughed. Simon was trying without success to understand what exactly had happened and how it had happened so fast. It will be, princess, he said, like you were there. Something in the way he said it tripped up her sudden mood. Her expression turned sober even sad. She smiled again, a slower, more rueful smile, then quickly stepped forward, startling Simon so that he almost raised a hand to ward her off. She brushed his cheek with her cool lips. I know you will be brave, Simon. Come back safely. I shall pray for you. Immediately she was gone, running across the courtyard like a little girl her dark cape a smoky swirl as she disappeared into the twilight archway. Simon stood holding her scarf. He thought of it and her smile when she kissed his cheek, and he felt something smolder into flame inside of him. It seemed in some way he did not fully understand that a single torch had been lit against the vast gray chill looming in the north. It was only a single point of brightness in a dreadful storm. But even a lone fire could bring a traveler home safe. He rolled the soft cloth into a ball and slipped it into his shirt. I am glad you have come so quickly, Lady Vorsheva said. The brilliance of her yellow dress seemed reflected in her dark eyes. My lady honors me, the monk replied, his eyes straying about the room. Vorsheva laughed harshly. You are the only one who thinks it honorable to visit me, but no matter. You understand what it is you must do? I am sure that I have it all correctly. It is a matter difficult in execution, but easily grasped in concept. He bowed his head. Good. Then wait no longer, for the more wait, the less chance of success. Also, more chance for tongues to wag. She whirled away to the back chamber in a rush of silks. Um, my lady, the man blew on his fingers. The prince's chambers were cold, the fire unlit. There is the matter of uh, payment. I thought you did this as honor for me, sir, Vorsheva called from the back room. Well a day, madam, I am but a poor man. 
What you ask will take resources. He blew on his fingers again, then thrust his hands deep into his robe. She came back, bearing a purse of shiny cloth. That I know. Here, it is in gold as I promised. Half now, half when I receive proof that your task is completed. She handed him the purse, then drew back. You stink of wine. Is that the sort of man you are trusted with his grave task? It is the sacramental wine, my lady. Sometimes on my difficult road it is the only thing to drink. You must understand. He favored her with a diffident smile, then made the sign of the tree over the gold before stowing it in the pocket of his robe. We do what we must to serve God's will. Forsheva nodded slowly. That I can understand. Do not fail me, sir. You serve a great purpose, and not just for me. I understand, lady. He bowed, then turned and left. Forsheva stood and stared at the parchments strewn on the prince's table and let out a deep breath. The thing was done. Twilight of the day after he spoke to the princess found Simon in the chambers of Prince Joswa, preparing to say farewell. In a sort of daze, as though he had just awakened, he stood listening as the prince had his final words with Binibic. The boy and the troll had spent the whole of the dark day preparing their kit, obtaining a new fur-lined cloak and helmet for Simon, along with a light mail shirt to wear beneath his outer clothing. The coat of thin ringlets, Haystan had pointed out, would not save him from a direct sword blow or an arrow to the heart, but would stand him in good stead in the case of some less than deadly assault. Simon found the weight of it reassuring, but Haystan warned him that at the end of a long day's journey he might not feel so cheerful about it. Your soldier carries many burdens, boy, the big man told him, and sometimes keeping alive's the hardest one. Haystan himself had been one of the three Urkenlanders to step forward when the captains had called for men. Like his two companions, Ethelburn, a scarred, bushy, bushy mustached veteran nearly as big as Haystan, and Grimrick, a slender, hawkish man with bad teeth and watchful eyes. He had spent so long preparing for siege that any sort of action was welcome, even something as dangerous and mysterious as this quest looked to be. When Haystan found out Simon was going too, he was even more adamant in his desire to join them. To send such a boy's madness, he growled, especially when he's not finished learning to swing sword or shoot arrow. I best go and keep it teaching him. Duke is Grimner's man, Sludig, was also there, a young Rimmersman attired like the Urkenlanders in furs and conical helmet. In place of the long sword the others carried, blonde bearded Sludig had two notch bladed hand axes thrust in his belt. He grinned cheerfully at Simon, anticipating his question. Sometimes one gets stuck in a skull or rib cage. The Rimmer's garter said. He spoke the Westerling tongue nimbly with almost as little accent as the Duke. It is nice to have another to use until you get the first one out. Nodding, Simon tried to smile back. Well met again, Simon. Sludig extended a calloused hand. Again? We met once before at Hodron's Abbey? Sludig laughed. But you spent the journey ass end up across Anskaldir's saddle. I hope that is not the only way you know how to ride. Simon blushed, clasped the northerner's hand, and turned away. We have turned up little to help you on your way, Yarnago was regretfully telling Binibic. The Scandian monks left scant word about the Colman's expedition, besides the transactions of its outfitting. They probably thought him a madman. Most likely they had it correctly, the troll observed. He was burnishing the bone-handled knife he had carved to replace the missing piece of his staff. We did find one thing, said Strangyard. 
The priest's hair stood up in wild tufts, and his eye patch sat a little off center as though he had come straight from spending an entire night poring over his books, which he had. The Abbey's bookkeeper wrote, The Baron does not know how long his journeying to the Rhymer's tree shall last. It is unfamiliar, Jan Auger said. In fact, it is probably something that the monk misheard or got third hand. But it is a name. Perhaps it will make more sense when you reach the mountain Ermsheim. Perhaps, said Joshua thoughtfully, it is a town along the way, a village at the mountain's foot. Perhaps, Benedict answered doubtfully, but from what I am knowing of those places, there is nothing lying between the ruins of the Skendi monastery and the mountains. Nothing there is but ice, trees, and rocks, of course. Plenty of those things there are. As final farewells were spoken, Simon heard Sang Fugel's voice drift out from the room in back, where he was singing for the Lady Vorsheva. And shall I go a-wandering, out in the winter's chill? Or shall I come now home again? Whate'er thou sayst, I will. Simon picked up his quiver and looked for the third or fourth time to make sure the white arrow was still there. Oh, I've got about a couple of minutes left, by the way, so I'm almost done. Bewildered, as though caught in some slow and clinging dream, he realized that he was setting off on a journey once more, and again he was not quite sure why. His time at Naglamond had been so brief. Now it was over, at least for a long while. As he touched the blue scarf tied loosely at his throat, he realized he might not see any of the others in this room again. Anybody at Naglamond. Sang Fugel, old Towser, or Miriamel. He thought he felt his heart trip for a moment, the beat stuttering like a drunkard, and was reaching for something to lean on when he felt a strong hand clasp his elbow. There you be, lad. It was Haystan. Bad enough that you know learning with a sword and bow. Now we're going to put you to horseback. Horseback, Simon said. I'll like that. No, you won't, Haystan smirked. Not for a month or two. Joshua said a few words to each one of them, and then there were warm, solemn hand clasps all around. A short while later, they were in the dark, cold courtyard, where Kantaka and seven stamping, steaming horses awaited them, five for riding and a pair for carrying heavy gear. If there was a moon, it was hidden, like a sleeping cat in the blanket of clouds. Good it is that we have this darkness, Binnevik said, swinging up onto the new saddle on Kantaka's gray back. The men, seeing the troll's steed for the first time, exchanged wondering looks as Binnevik clicked his tongue and the wolf sprang out before them. A group of soldiers quietly raised the oiled portcullis, and they were out under the broad sky. The field of shadowy nails spread around them as they made for the close-looming hills. Goodbye, everyone, Simon said quietly. They started up the sloping path. High above, on the stile, at the crest of the hill overlooking Naglamond, a black shape was watching. Even with his keen eyes, Ingen Jagger could make out little more in the, motion, in the moonless murk than that someone had left the castle by the eastern gate. That, however, was more than enough to raise his interest. He stood, rubbing his hands, and considered calling one of his men to go down with him and get a better look. Instead, he lifted his fist to his mouth and hooted, like a snow owl. Seconds later, a huge shape appeared from the scrub growth and leaped onto the stile beside him. It was a hound, bigger even than the one killed by the troll's tame wolf, shining white in the moonlight, its eyes twin pearl slots in a long, grinning face. It growled a deep, cavernous rumble and swiveled its head from side to side, nostrils wrinkling. Yes, Nikua, yes, Ingen hissed quietly. 
It is time to hunt once more. A moment later, the stile was empty. The leaves rattled ever so gently beside the ancient tiles, but no wind was blowing. And that is the end for tonight. And tomorrow we're going to start on chapter 35, The Raven and the Cauldron. So we are doing pretty well. We're up to chapter 35. I, excuse me. I believe there's 44 chapters in the first book. That's my recollection. 44 in the first. Don't remember how many in the second. And I think 60 in to Green Angel Tower. But anyway, so we're about three quarters of the way through. It's pretty darn good. Um, 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 yeah, more than three quarters. Anyway, with that, I am going to wrap it up for the night. Um, I am going to go turn the water on in my sink and just watch it because it's so exciting to have water. Um, meanwhile, I hope all of you have had a good evening and I thank you, or good morning for most of you in Europe anyway. Um, and I thank you very much for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Um, and I will be talking to you soon until I see you again, whether tomorrow at 7 p.m. or next week at 1 a.m. when I'll be reading again. Um, I, I ask you to take good care of yourselves, take good care of your loved ones and the people around you. And that's the way that we will all make it through this life with help from others. So again, thank you very much. Peace and be well. See you soon.